Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome you all to this next lecture in this paper on democratic processes and social movements in India. Uh, this topic in today's lecture is gender in Indian politics. We all know that gender is the central issue of Indian politics for a very long time. We are also aware that the component of Indian politics comprises not only of one particular identity that is caste or one particular class of people or section of people but it goes beyond that various kinds of ascriptive identities constitute and shape politics in india gender is one of them in this paper we will see other than the movement that how gender as a concept has shaped the politics in india not only in the post independence phase but also in the pre independence phase the presentation of today's lecture will have three components, three important components. One, we will start with understanding the difference between gender and sex and we will see that how gender constitutes the socio-economic and political component of this lecture. In addition to that, we will also see that how over a period of time the idea of gender has evolved in the Indian politics. I have, as I have said that I have divided this lecture into three parts. So the first part will uh, go into the pre-independence phase and see, we will examine that how gender has constituted the idea of politics in India and how it influenced the outcomes in the form of the Indian constitution. Similarly, moving to the second phase, we will see that how the idea of gender was contested in 1950s and 60s and that contestation continued in 1970s. After that, in the third part of the lecture, we will see that how in the third phase, the idea of gender underwent tectonic shift and new components got attached to it. That component eventually influenced the politics in India to great an extent. In this phase, we will also see that how reservation for women in Panchayati Ra system and later on the whole formation of LGBTQ community had influenced the very idea of conception of gender. So now we will begin the lecture. Uh, we know that understanding gender in Indian politics is not an easy task. It constitutes a lot of component, it constitutes lots of dynamics. To begin with, we need to first understand that what is the overall understanding of gender. For that we need to understand that there is difference between what we call as gender and sex. Sex we all know is the biological component of human body. So the determination of sex at the time of birth is what assigned to someone in the form of biological entity of a person. So a person, a human being can be a male or a female or the third gender. But that sex component of human body is what we as calling as the biological component continues to remain with the body. What happens after this in the form of the social identity of that human being in the form of male or female get constituted in terms of men, women or third gender. In this process, we find that the formation of gender starts taking place. In other words, the idea of gender is more of a social concept rather than a biological concept. So gender necessarily comprises of the con idea of power, idea of economic entity, idea of being a moral entity, not only being a biological entity. In the modern discourse of the idea of sex and gender, we find that the framework of gender is largely constituted by the discourse of notion of rights, notion of liberty, idea of equality in the society and the principle of justice. Now here it is important to understand and underline that if we look into the liberal framework of understanding human and the human society and the constituent of economic and political world, we find 
that human beings are largely con considered as the atomized indi individual beings. But for a very long time, even in the modern period, it was always considered that the male or the male component of the gender aspect are dominating the socio-economic and political realms. It was somehow got constituted that the, in the evolution of human societies that female lack certain, certain uh, components in terms of their physical strength, in terms of their mental strength, and thus they need to be confined to their households. On the other hand, male being within quote what I will I would like to call as the male body is supposed to be all powerful and mentally efficient enough to tackle the problems of our everyday life. And that's how the male got to dominate the all walks of human life. It is in this process of creation of binary of male and female within which the male used to dominate the relationship that the whole idea of gender gets formed. And thus we see that even in the modern liberal framework, despite the fact that the discourse of rights, liberty, equality and justice are the central key component, then too the gender injustice continues to shape the outcome of socioeconomic and political realms. Interestingly, it is within this whole framework that women constitute a large part of the society and they eventually realized, along with women later on the third gender also, they eventually realized that we need to exploit this whole idea of liberty, equality, justice and rights framework for demanding the rights and equality for themselves and eventually the idea of gender justice emerged in the society. The core of this whole framework of fighting against the male dominance in the gender injustice led in society is this idea that every human being have equal moral worth and thus we see that over a period of time the whole framework of gender justice started influencing the politics across the globe. It's true that part of this whole argument of men and women being treated as equal in all realms of life emerged in the West in the modern times, but that doesn't mean that the idea of equality between men and women was not existing in the political consciousness or social consciousness of the third world countries and more so of India. So, in the next slide, as we will see, that we need to understand that what are the factors which condition women, or in other words, how the women, the idea of women gets constituted and conditioned over a period of time. Thus, the word conditioning here is very important. Some of the important or crucial tropes through which the idea of women gets constituted in the society are following. One, familial that is the idea of motherhood, sisterhood, wife and in all these categories, the social categories we, which we are so familiar with and we take it for granted, we find that the idea of women as a docile and always caregiving is something which is perpetuated and thus over a period of time it gets imbibed in the society in both uh, uh, men and women that women are always caregivers and they are docile they are supposed to follow the instructions given by the society and more so by the male counterparts of their, of their uh, realm. It happens so eventually that society as the second component which conditions being a woman on the basis of racial, caste or social behavior. Thus we see that there are these kind of understandings that how women are getting constituted in terms of their culture, in terms of the novel writing, in terms of poems, in terms of the idea of beauty in culture. Similarly, within the caste component, we find that how women are caricatured or framed in a particular fashion or in a particular manner in different caste groups in, or in other different social groups. For instance, women in Muslim communities or in Christian communities are always caricatured or framed 
in a different manner in comparison to women in Hindu societies. Similarly, within the Hindu societies, women belonging to different caste groups also gets constituted or framed or shaped or over a period of time feminized in a particular fashion in comparison to other castes. Similarly, there are certain social behaviors which shape women and the idea of women. For instance, whether women should laugh at the public places, how loud one can speak in the public places, the manner in which one is supposed to sit and stand in the public spaces, all these things shapes the idea of being a woman in the public places. Similarly, the third important factor which conditions being a woman is economic, that is, that how working or non-working women are different or in what manner being a working woman is also supposed to take care of her family. Similarly, being a woman, the unpaid labor which she is continuously uh, contributing in her family life is something which goes unnoticed. The whole question of participation of women in the workforce is always debated in the economic realms and different economists have always highlighted that how the underrepresentation of women in the workforce shapes the economic outcomes in the negative manner. Similarly, the fourth important component of this whole process of factors conditioning women is the cultural one where the idea of womanhood gets constituted through the cultural practices. Thus, we see that various art forms, various other activities in the cultural realms are always supposed to be carried forward by women and thus eventually it happens so that the idea of motherhood, the idea of sisterhood also gets shaped by different paintings, by different kinds of storytellings and different kinds of rituals in the society. In the Indian context, we find and as I uh, promised to you in the initial phase of this lecture, that the lecture will be divided into three parts. So in this, we will see that how different stages of interaction between the idea of gender and politics in the Indian society has constituted the democratic processes in India. Thus, we will see also that how over a period of time, a new conception of gender politics has emerged in India. The idea of this uh, division in different uh, phases in the Indian politics about the idea of gender is to understand that how this trope of gender and politics has evolved within the framework of democracy and democratic processes in India. We will also see that how over a period of time, the democratization of women's movement in India and democratization of this whole process of the claim of just right by women in the society has constituted the very idea of politics in India in the different realms. Starting with the first phase, we, as we know that during the freedom struggle, many voices came into interaction with each other in terms of bargaining with the British Empire to get the just pos positions in the society. It was in this whole process of bargaining with with the British Empire that we also find that how over a period of time, not only men, but also women started participating. This whole journey was very complex. It was not as simple as we are stating in this lecture. The whole process underwent different phases within this first phase. To begin with, we can recall that how in the initial phases, in the early 19th century with the coming of writings of Raja Ram Mohan Rai, Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar and others that we are finding that the women cause or the women issues were raised or the gender issues were raised mainly by the men in the society who were at the influential positions. We do not find any name coming from the women section of the society who are fighting for the just place for women. But that situation eventually transformed and changed. In the first phase, the organization of political subjectivity was something which was very important. It was during this phase that in the colonial period that the struggle for rights in terms of sati or fighting against the sati, fighting against child marriages, 
and similarly fighting for right to education was something which was central in the second half of 19th century. What was interesting about this speech was despite the fact that they struggle against sati, struggle against child marriages or fight for remarriages or fight for education for women were taking place across India more so in uh, West Bengal, in Maharashtra and in the province of Ta Madras what we call as uh, Tamil Nadu in present context that all those fight were primarily concentrated around the modern framework of right to women on the basis of what the men were demanding at that point of time. It was during the anti-colonial movement in India that extensive women's mobilization followed by substantial institutional gain. Thus, we can safely say that during the anti-colonial movement in India, there were extensive movement women's mobilization, but this mobilization took place only in the later part of India's national movement with the coming of Gandhi. We will see this whole aspect in the next part of this lecture. Women's varied and extensive role were recognized during this whole phase. It was not only limited in terms of participation in political mobilization, but also the non-violent civil disobedience movement as it was started by Gandhi was also had the significant role in terms of invoking the pride within women and constituted the larger political consensus around the issue of women's participation. Thus, there was the shift from the activism of the urban middle classes to that of the rural poor women. We see that during the Indian national movement in the first phase, not only women started participating in the urban localities in the cities like Kol Kolkata and Bombay, but also eventually it happened so that the women's participants started spreading in the village or rural sites of North India as well as in the South India. And thus, the Indian national movement by late 1920s and early 30s started spreading like a wildfire across India and women's participation went up many fold. And Gandhi's contribution in this whole process was very significant. Gender aspect in the Indian political scenario during the Indian national movement needs to be also analyzed in terms of the reform movements during the colonial period. As I have already mentioned that you, you see that how the movement for women's rights started in terms of fight against sati and child marriages. This kind of struggle for women's position in the society and their eventual contribution in the Indian national movement needs to be understood in the framework of two important components during the Indian national movement. The first was revivalist, that is, those who were fighting for women's rights in terms of the framework of the glory of ancient past. So, the, for example, the usual invocation was that the Indian tradition and the Indian ancient past has a lot to offer in the form of the resources through which women's rights in the society can be easily taken care of. Thus, they used to give example of Gargi Yagyavalk dialogue as an interesting trope to figure out that how the Indian past or the Indian tradition, cultural practices, religious practices always considered women as someone who are very important to the whole framework of society women always had the equal rights to men and the, we need not to go back to Britishers to figure out that how we are going to give the due respect and due place to women in the society. On the other hand, we had the other school of thought within Indian national movement who were fighting for uh, women's rights and they can be safely called as reformists. Reformists like Raja Ram Mohan Rai and Ishwachand Vidya Sagar were those who used to highlight the glorious past of women in India, but they were not ready to rely solely on that. Their argument was that we need to adopt to the new realities of modernity and modernization and the modern framework of poli politics within which the discourse of individuals, right, liberty, equality and justice are important. And thus, women's fight for 
right in the society needs to be placed within this modern framework. Thus, they can be safely called as reformists. Ashish Nandi, a very renowned political scientist, has highlighted this binary of revivalist versus reformist kind of conception within Indian national movements in the following manners. He argues that masculinity continued to be the central feature of these two schools against British shaping of the Indian society as effeminate. Now, this is a very interesting argument which Ashish Nandi is making when he says that when Britishers came to India, they framed the Indian society in a very particular Victorian, uh, through the uh, Victorian lens, where they argued that the Indians are inherently feminine and thus they do not have the courage and power to fight against the British Empire. It was to break that kind of framework of Indian society or the understanding of Indian society that both reformists and revivalists relied on the masculine characterization of women to argue that women can also be part of Indian national movement and they can fight. While saying so, they continued to harp on the masculine caricature or the masculine idea of power, violence and struggle against the British Empire to argue that India too has something to offer in terms of women's right place in the political processes. Both reformers and revivalists shared a belief in glorious pre-colonial, pre-Muslim past where women were worshipped and both used nationalist arguments though mobilizing this picture of the past in different ways. Thus, as you can see, the reformers and revivalists, both of them shared this belief that the pre-colonial, pre-Muslim phase in India, that is precisely in short, the ancient phase in India was always the glorious past and we can use that, we can invoke that glorious past in order to stand for women's right in the modern times. While on the one hand, reformers demonstrated that Indians still had the capacity to meet the enlightened standards of the West, while revivalists assert that Indian traditions had the original resources to deal with its problem and did not need the foreign imperialist intervention. Now, as I have already discussed, so I will not go into the details, the difference between the reformist and revivalist. Reformist and revivalist both are recognizing the glorious past of the Indian tradition vis-a-vis -vis a position of women in the society. But the reformists argue that we need to now rely on the modern framework of political rights for women's just position in the society. On the other hand, revivalists argue that we need to continue to invoke the past to fight for women's position and we need not to negotiate with the Britishers on these terms. During freedom struggle, the gender discourse in India partially succeeded in highlighting the intersectionality of gender with class and caste issues. Thus, as we see that in this phase, the India the gender discourse in India partially succeeded in highlighting the intersectionality of gender with class and caste issues. The outcome of independence witnessed the drafting of the constitution. In addition, women achieved the right to vote after a long struggle during the freedom struggle and became active in large numbers. Similarly, during freedom struggle, feminist agenda underwent various stages. Apart from women's issues, it was actively pursuing nationalist agenda as women joined Indian National Congress in large number and they were in leadership role in 1910s onwards. They were also part of revolutionary groups. Thus, as you can see in this slide, that there were various advantages to women movement by the time Indian constitution was framed. Despite all the limitations, by 1947, India ensured that it's half of its population, that is women, get the due position in the society. To start with, women got the right to vote in 1947 with the coming of the Indian constitution. Women were throughout in the later part of the Indian national movement were active participants in all walks of life. And by the end of this Indian freedom struggle, we also find that women were not only participating as the passive resistance participants or 
actively participating only in Gandhian movement, but they were also part of the violent revolutionary movements and thus they proved that they are not less in any terms from their male counterparts. Generally, a question is raised that how feminist was the women's movement or how feminist was the gender discourse during the Indian National Movement. In other words, whether women participants during the colonial struggle were feminist enough. Now, this is interesting question. This question is coming from this framework where one may end up arguing that well, one can accept that women were part of Indian National Movement, but that participation was, and this could be a hypothetical question, that whether women were participating as a citizen of this country, as a resident of this country, fighting against the Britishers as their male counterparts were struggling or fighting against? Or is it that, that the women in India were playing the simultaneous double role of not only fighting against the British Empire, but they were also fighting against the patriarchal structures of the society and thus fighting for their own rights. Of course, they did not use the feminist as it would have meant prioritizing women's liberation, women's India's independence. One can safely argue that women were playing both the roles simultaneously. Just the difference was that women were very cleverly not using, not necessarily using the feminist lens to project their issues and their argument as it would have led to prioritizing their own issues over the India's national freedom. Thus, they may have strategically adopted this policy of highlighting India's national movement, knowing very well that once they will ensure India's national freedom, that will eventually translate into freedom of women within the patriarchal society. In view of that, women came up with this plan of interlinking the national movement with gender discourse. And as I have highlighted, that Gandhi played a very important role in this whole process through his own actions and by inviting women to be participant in the Indian National Movement. One of the aides of uh, Gandhi, Manu, she wrote a very interesting um, a small booklet or a small write-up called as Gandhi, My Mother, where she has highlighted that how Gandhi was so keen about ensuring that women must participate in the national movement, not only as just a participant of the freedom struggle, but they should also liberate in their process, their own by mind and thought and fight for their own gender justice. Now moving to the second phase, we find that after the independence, the first two decades of 1950s and 60s saw some very interesting churning or, tra or transformation within the gender discourse in the Indian politics. The national consensus which was built up during the Indian national movement started dismantling. Many of the promises which were made during the Indian national movement in terms of gender discourse and gender equality in the society started waning. And it was during this phase that some of the organizations which were shaped around the left political parties or those political parties which were influenced by the Marxist thought, they started questioning that where are women in the new imagination of Indian nation. Now this is something which is very interesting to figure out that how one understand that the imagination of Indian nation is of course needs to be constituted by all the components of the society including women. But by 1950s and 60s you find that the issue of gender justice or women in politics in India took the back stage and a new form of politics which was largely shaped around the Nehruvian consensus of modernization and development of modern industries which took over. In this, the issue of poverty was central but the co women's question took the back stage. Similarly, during the third phase we find that the quest for autonomy of women's issue or women's movement took a new turn in terms of fight for dowry against the rape laws or for political parties to start paying the heat to women's issue. But these were all in a very limited manner and continued for almost two decades. A wide range of movements emerged 
during this way in terms of opposing deforestation, the violation of tribal land rights, the mistreatment of slum dwellers and the oppression of lower caste. Thus, in the third phase, we also find that there was diversification of issues which we gender and politics in India. I am not going into the detail of this, all the development which happened during the 1970s and 80s for a very specific reason that there will be a, a separate lecture on this issue of women's movement in India where we will find that how in the different phases of this gender politics in India different kinds of movement emerge and how they shape the politics in India. In this lecture we will solely rely on and solely focus on the conception of gender and how it shaped and constituted the political outcomes in terms of democratic processes and democracy in India. Amita Basu in one of her writing elaborates there are differences of method and approaches to urban feminist and rural feminists. Going back to uh, one slide we will see that how gender and women's movement in India have taken a new turn in the recent past and how this turn has certain kind of particular kind of past in the 70s and 80s. To understand this framework of gender and women's movement in India one need to keep in mind that women's movement in India generally can be divided into two parts that is one the movements which are largely guided and shaped by the urban women and on the other hand there are those which we call as the rural women and both kind of component of women's movement in India have shaped the gender discourse and political parties and political outcomes in India. We find that more those uh, movements which we talked about as I will go to the previous slide to show you that during the third phase we saw that various new kinds of movement started emerging in terms of dowry to rape laws to political parties giving voice to women's issues. Similarly, tribal rights, deforestation, slum dwellers and lower caste women also started participating that these kind of movements brought the idea of gender inequality to the forefront of the political discourse in India. Most of these were broadly urban centric movements and urban led gender discourse. But what was interesting was that feminist organizations during that time were formed autonomously. So not necessarily that they were framed or they were shaped by a particular kind of political ideology coming from the left parties. And in this process, new kind of stages, new kind of platforms also came into picture. Some of the important ones were Samta Manch, Istri Sangharsh Samiti, Istri Mukti Sangathan, Feminist Network Collective, Istri Shakti Sangathan, Purogami Sangathan, Saheli, Kali for Women and Manusi. If you read any of the liter available literatures on gender gen justice or gender politics in the Indian context, we generally come across at least two to three of these organizations which I mentioned here in terms of their active participation for women's justice and gender justice in India. Their primary concerns included violence against women as manifest in dowry deaths, rape of women by the police and security forces and domestic violence. We find that in Antabasu's writing that she elaborates that how some there were always the differences of methods and approaches vis-a-vis -vis the urban feminist and rural feminist in terms of raising the kinds of issues. So you find that the urban feminist or the gender discourse in political processes in India was largely confined around the issues of upper middle class women who were talking about the pro problems of dowry or problems of divorce in the society or at max the problem of rape laws and how they are not just to the gender discourse in India. On the other hand, if you look into the gender issues in the rural sectors or the rural areas, we find that the nature of violence, the intensity of violence and the whole process of dealing with those issues were dramatically different from the urban centers. And thus, those feminist movements which were emerging in the rural areas, they were largely focusing on the issues of alcoholism, 
or issue of abuse or issue of unpaid laborers in the rural areas of women or the problem of caste discrimination of women. She further argues that urban groups were fiercely committed to retaining their autonomy from political parties to prevent the lure of resources, influence and power from blunting their radicalism. Now this is interesting argument which Amrita Basu argues that in the urban centers the gender discourse of politics was largely trying to make uh, its autonomy speak for itself in the sense that they tried to maintain the distance from the political organizations and political parties so as to continue with their independent voice for their own freedom and justice. They were well aware of the fact that if they will subscribe to a particular political organization or ideology, they will end up losing their autonomy and eventually end up blunting their radicalism. And thus, urban feminist movement was primarily drawn to non-electoral issues like violence against women. And it was precisely for this reason that in 1970s and 80s, the feminist gender discourse in India was not necessarily getting translated into any kind of political discourse in the sense that political parties were not part of these movements. Of course, there were advantages and disadvantages, disadvantages of this whole process in the sense that of course the autonomy was there, the radicalism was there, but since the political parties were not part of these movements, it happened so that the substantive gain in the political realm were limited in the form of institutional outcomes. Retaining uh, their autonomy from parties and staying out of the electoral domain was again something which was constantly, uh, which is constantly underlined by Amta Basu in terms of analyzing the gender discourse in 1970s and 80s. But other important aspect of that phase was that those women organizations who were fighting for gender ju justice they worked closely with the courts and bureaucracy for making their voice heard. On the other hand, the grassroots movement with which women were closely associated were those of the poorest and most marginal groups. Now this is again a very interesting aspect which is highlighted by Amita Basu that during that phase, the upper middle class women who are fighting for those causes they were basically fighting in the urban centers and they were close to uh, resolving their issues through the channel of bureaucracy and the channel of courts. On the other hand, at the grassroots level movements, the poorest and the most marginalized, generally the tribals, the landless poor, slum dwellers and subsistence agriculturalists, they were fighting their uh, issues and which generally had little electoral clout and no electoral aspirations. Thus, we find that both in the urban and the rural sectors, the women issues and the gender issues, though they were fighting in their own manner and in the very intense form, but not necessarily since they were not exploiting the political resources, the political parties and political organizations, thus the political outcomes were limited because they had very less electoral clouds as well as electoral aspirations. Despite this limitation, one need to also understand that what were the major gains during this phase. One of the most important major gains was that in the courts and in the bureaucracy, the voices of the women got heard and their representation was ensured. In, the, in terms of the cases were put up, some of the judges took notice of those issues and some of the radical judgments came during 70s and 80s which influenced the gender politics in India for decades to come. Of course, the limitation was that the influence was not in the electoral arena. Women representation in the parliament and state assemblies remained low, hovering around 5 to 8 percent for very long. Eventually, it happened so that by early 90s, the creation of National Commission on the Status of Women to Investigate Women's Conditions and Make Recommendations took place. And this was the major gain 
in terms of the gender politics in India in 1980s. After that, the gender and political transformation started happening. So by the time the third phase was about to end and a new kind of and thus we find that new kinds of issues started emerging. Those issues were in the framework or within the framework of new constitutional amendments which took place in through the 73rd and 74th that is providing 33 percent reservation for women to the three tier of local government Panchayati Raj represented a milestone in the process of decentralization. As we all know that during the Narasimha Rao government in 1992, the reservation for women in the Panchayati Raj system started and with that we also find that how eventually lakhs and lakhs of women got the representation in the Panchayati Raj bodies which were now the constitutional bodies and women got a new voice in the whole political processes from which they were not necessarily part during the 1960s and 70s. The amendments contain provisions for reservation of 33 percent of elective seats for women in the village, block and district councils, an equal number in the urban municipal council through the 74th amendment also ensured that women not only in the rural but also in the urban areas are going to shape the outcome of political processes in India. This led to ushering of a new democratization and a new democratic politics in India in terms of almost equal participation of women in the political processes. India's population as we know consists of around 15 percent of scheduled caste and 7.5 percent of scheduled tribes constituting around 22.5 percent of seats reserved for them out of which one third are for women. Now this is interesting aspect that it is not only that women got reservation in those seats but within the reserved constituencies for SCs and STs one third seats were reserved for women and that was on the basis of rotation. Thus many new seats started turning up into women's reservation for women's reservation and eventually women got the representation in the hinterlands of Indian politics in rural areas and in villages. Eventually it happened so that by late 1990s the democratic processes in India soon realized and turned up into one of the most promising aspects in terms of Panchayati Raj institutions and reforms in India. Women were, have, had now acquired the resources, the political resources and the development of skills which have enabled them to excel in managing the new developmental projects in their own rural areas. We also see that over a period of time they have been able to articulate their priorities for basic needs and amenities such as food, drinking water, schools, healthcare centers, roads and security. If you go to the rural areas of India in last two decades you will find that there are going to there are stark differences in comparison to the villages of 1970s and 80s in India. The old residents of those villages inform us and tell those who are working in this area that over a period of time because of the presence of women in those elected bodies that the whole priority of the budget allocation has changed or transformed because of women's focus more on road, on a school, on healthcare system that new kind of possibilities have emerged in the rural areas and new because of that a new kind of politics has started emerging. Famous economist and Nobel Prize winner Esther de Flo's findings suggest that women invest more than men in projects that meet community needs which are for water and roads. Thus as I was suggesting that some of the famous Nobel Prize winner economists and others have worked extensively in the villages of Punjab and Rajasthan in India to safely conclude that women are allocating budgets in a more meaningful manner by focusing on the construction of road in providing healthcare services and schooling in India and thus ushering a completely new era of the development discourse in India which is more gender just. For instance as uh, Esther Deflo shows that in rural Punjab over 4500 women 
are heading 2446 panchayats and have a common mini and they have a common minimum program which they share with all to and the main focus or thrust of their common minimum program is upliftment of eco sections of society ensuring adult literacy pensions for the aged and the poor better education and healthcare facilities and the development of their villages in their five year terms now this lead to another issues that we need to understand in the context of the rural sectors in india and the gender discourse and gender outcome in the indian politics that is regarding the lit women how one need to understand the whole framework or process of the lit women and thus the question comes do they talk differently now why is this question coming up for that we need to go back to our understanding of gender discourse and gender politics in india in terms of highlighting that how in the last 75 years or so it happens that in the major part of that whole struggle women were generally either marginalized or even if they were part of the political processes in india they were at the back stage when the women's movement and the gender discourse in politics started emerging it emerged in a very particular fashion where the autonomous movements and organizations emerged which were not necessarily part of the political parties and organizations and we find that if you look into the nature of women's participation in those movements it is very clear that most of those movements were limited to the urban areas in the urban centers that is in the cities in addition most of those movements were largely guided by and shaped by the issues and problems of urban educated upper or middle class and upper caste women and thus it had limitations in terms of reach out to all the sections of women it is in this context that one may read two important readings one by sharmila rege and other by gopal guru to see and understand that why in this whole process or a struggle for gender justice in india it is important to highlight that dalit women issues are generally get under shrugged under the carpet or not necessarily underlined by the dominant women's movement in india sarmila rege in uh, highlighting the problems of women's movement in 1980s also underlines that new changes which took place because the upper caste women's movement failed to underline the problems of diverse sections of women and it is she highlights that it is in 1980s that for the first time dalit women started protesting and coming out with their with their own separate organizations and groups to highlight and translate their own sufferings and their problems in the political realm in continuity gopal guru in his famous article dalit women talk differently argues that dalit women are doubly disadvantaged and thus they their problems are always need not to be necessarily constituted by the upper caste upper class or middle class women but dalit women need to have their own separate voice while making this argument gopal guru argues that dalit women in india suffer twice they suffer as a dalit who are going to the market or who are staying in their households or in the agriculture sector that they are discriminated because of being a dalit in addition they are also getting discriminated because a woman not only this as gopal guru shows that they are doubly disadvantaged in terms of being a dalit as well as being a woman gopal guru argues that dalit women in india have different epistemological experiences different kinds of sufferings and thus because of those kind of different kinds of experiences that their epistemology or their theory of knowledge of those experiences needs to be articulated by the dalit women themselves rather than by any other representatives his argument is that only those who have suffered 
they can express their problems in a more meaningful manner. In continuity, if we try to figure out and understand the major challenges of gender discourse in India, we find that uh, Nivedita Menon in, his, in her writing highlights the major challenges in following terms. First, the struggles that got lost in the courts often remained there for a long time. Now, Nivedita Menon's writing highlights the limits of gender politics in India and the challenges and she starts with the first major problem that is the long durations for which the courts are lingering or sitting on the cases and not passing the judgment. Second, that the legal battles diverted women's attention from grassroots struggles. The other major challenge is that most of the gender discourse politics in India gets entangled in the legal discourses and the resources and time of women's movement go into resolving the crisis within the courts rather than fighting at the grassroots level. The third important aspect is that the focus on rights was, is, was associated with the narrow constructions of women's interest and identities. Now this is another third important challenge which is there for women's movement in India in terms of understanding that how the whole discourse of narrow construction of women's interest and identities in terms of either dowry or their own rights or freedom fails to understand and underline women as economic entity and their equal share in the economic resources. It is in this context that a few questions needs to be raised. Amita Basu in one, in one of her writings raises few pertinent questions. Her argument goes like that that over a mil million women are represented in the three-tiered panchayati raj system and with the growth of multi-party system since 1990s, political parties have increasingly sought women's electoral support. And yet, most women continue to lack effective political power in parties and the state. Women's access to power is still mediated by their relationship to male kin and is often indirect and symbolic. So this is very important question which Amrita asks that despite the fact that women got reservation in Panchayati Ra systems, despite the fact that there were so many gendered issues raised over a period of time, why is it so that women are str still struggling and fighting for their right positions in the society? Why is it so that most of their issues are not getting passed in the parliament and that that they continue, the women continue to lack effective political power in parties and state. If you read, if you look into all the political parties and their organizational strength and the uh, component within the organizations, you find that most of the uh, political parties in India have very less representation of women and equally less representation in terms of their ticket distribution to these uh, to women as well as of course because of the less uh, ticket given to women that very less number of women get represented in the parliament. At present not more than in last so many elections not more than 10 to 11 percent women got elected in the parliament and this is something which is not going up beyond the point. Parties and this is again the argument which Amita raises that parties have done little to provide women access to networks and resources that would enable them to ascend the ranks of party hierarchies. Amita argues that it is because of the limitations of the political parties in terms of not giving voice to the sufferings of women, in terms of not recruiting enough number of women in their rank and file that we find that these political parties lack the networks and resources in terms of women presence or female presence in their organizations. This has negatively impacted the women empowerment and gender discourse politics in India. In a, she goes on to highlight that and raises this question that to what an extent are there systematic differences between parties of the left, right and center and between national and regional parties in this regard. 
Now this is again very interesting important question one needs to keep in mind that despite the fact that left political parties in India claim that they are the sole fighters or sole representative of women's voice in India, if you look into the organizational strength and the membership of all the political parties, whether they subscribe to the left, the center or the right ideological spectrum, that all of them have almost equal representation of women and that almost equal representation of women is towards the minority side. That is, women get represented in a very less number in most of the political parties in India. Not only this, if you compare political parties in terms of cent those political parties which are dominated in the center, in terms of Congress, BJP and uh, left parties, why if you compare these political parties with the political parties functioning in the region or the state, we find that women representation is no better either in the regional parties or in the parties which are there in the center. In this context, how important are differences between parties in power and those in opposition in promoting women's participation and representation? Now, this is again very interesting question. One need to understand that despite all these limitations, if you look into the differences in terms of parties in power and those in the opposition, we find that both sides of the fence are hand in glove in terms of not necessarily giving equal representations to women and opposition part of parties those who are sitting in the oppositions they have also failed to highlight the limits or problems of women in terms of their less representation in political processes and parties. Basu further adds that a significant number of women have occupied leadership positions in India at the state and national level. So we can recall Indira Gandhi or we can recall Mayawati or Mamta Banerjee or Jayalalitha. All these political leaders at different points of time have played very crucial and important roles in their respective states and at the center. But despite all this, why is it so that the participation of women in the political parties has not gone up during their tenure within their own parties? Thus, we need to understand that it's not only the representation of women at the high position which will ensure women's participation, active participation in the political processes. But we need to go beyond that in order to highlight the limits of democratic processes in India in terms of doing gender justice. For that, one need to highlight that what are the systematic and structural obstacles to their effectiveness. A third important issue raised by Amita is that the relationship between political parties and social movements in India, which women have been active, that we need to reconfigure the relationship between the women's movement and political parties. Similarly, some movements which have deliberately refrained from allying with political parties needs to be reoriented. The others who have worked closely with them, we need to understand their relationship and they also need to reconfigure in order to ensure that more women get representations. We have also seen that parties as wider, there are others who are advancing women's political interest. For instance, uh, JDU in Bihar or some other parties in the South. But we have to understand that not only pushing the cause of women, but also representation of women in the organization, which is something very important. In the conclusion, as you can see that I'm suggesting you following three readings as the references, you may read and uh, figure out that how gender politics in India needs to be explained and understood in the new context of the developments which are taking place in the post-globalization, post-globalized world. Thank you.